Hi there, welcome to a, a dark edition of um, IndyCar. It's not often I make the connection between um, a war zone and the future independent Scotland, but I think it's fair to say that um, what is happening in Ukraine at the moment with the Russians attacking their power infrastructure uh, and the ease with which it seems to be getting destroyed makes you wonder whether the grid systems which most modern Western countries rely on are actually robust enough to withstand this kind of attack, but also any other kind of major problem with the power grid. We all rely on our energy coming through cables in an enormous grid system, like a giant wiring loom in which we have major um, power stations. So we have things like nuclear power stations, gas-fired power stations, offshore wind farms, and so on. But they're all very big manufacturing uh, power plants, which are centrally uh, feeding the power into this grid system. Now the problem with that is that to get that power to the places where it's needed it has to go at very high voltage across very vulnerable cables hanging from pylons and then it has to go to things called substations where that high voltage is then converted down to a low enough voltage to be transmitted to your home where it then has to go through a secondary transformer another substation locally which then converts that voltage into 240 volts alternating current for your home so it's a complicated system and it's vulnerable at a lot of different points but the problem with it is that all of the various um, nodes, the places where the power is, is taken to and converted into lower voltages are all very vulnerable. And this is what the Russians are doing at the moment, is they're destroying these substations which is blacking out one place after another. Now I've spoken many times about what Scotland ought to do with its, um, particularly with its renewable energy systems. And one of the key things which I had thought about many years ago, in fact, way, way back in the 1970s when I first had the idea of using tidal energy grids to pair the whole country. One of the things that occurred to me is that you need multiple sources of power, hundreds of them, not just half a dozen or a dozen big power stations. You want every single home able to generate at least some of its own electricity. And that means massive numbers of things like solar panels on people's roofs, and people owning a stake or owning a machine such as a wind turbine locally nearby which can pass power to those uh, locations in these rural communities independently of the power grid. So if anything goes down in one part of the grid, there are hundreds of other generators feeding into it no matter what. That just leaves the power cables needing to be replaced and perhaps occasionally an odd uh, step-down transformer. Now, if the transformers are, instead of being located above ground, as they are in Ukraine, easy targets for an enemy to knock out. And remember that Scotland, like Ukraine, suffers from very dark, cold winters, not perhaps as cold as those in Ukraine, but anyone living in the Northern Hemisphere near the poles, as we do, is subject to cold winter temperatures. And so it's very easy um, to cripple a country by simply knocking out its power supply or its gas supply. And we also heard today that the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines, which were recently ruptured by something, the I think the Norwegians or the Swedes, I can't remember, one, one of the Baltic states nearby investigated what was causing or what had caused those pipes to rupture and found traces of high explosives and not small quantities. So they were deliberately sabotaged. Which also leads me to think that if we are going to stake our claim to tidal energy, that we need to be able to protect those undersea systems from meddling by a malignant state such as the Russians who might come along with a submarine and drop some kind of charge next to uh, a, an installation or a cable or a pipeline and simply blow it up. But having a system where there's more than one source of energy located in hundreds of different places is definitely something which Scotland wants to look at doing. But more than that, we need more than one grid. We need three. We need a main grid which carries the current around the entire country. But inside of that, we need a subsidiary grid which supplies only industry. And industry requires usually more energy 
for longer than we do. When when individual houses are using energy, it spikes. At certain times of the day, we all come home for dinner, we put the kettle on, we put the cooker on, people put their laundry in, in the washing machines, and so there's a huge spike in demand. That can be met quite easily by things like hydroelectric energy, which is able to be brought on stream very quickly. But the problem is that in order to give everybody fairness when it comes to their energy, business users need to be charged a certain rate and have their own guaranteed supply. The second thing we need is uh, what I call the social grid. And this would be an extra grid system which is local where everybody who has solar panels on the roof or a small wind turbine or any other energy generating device nearby their village or on their house or somewhere close to where they live has the ability to both use the energy they produce locally for zero cost other than the investment in the equipment but also if they generate extra capacity to be able to sell that into this microgrid, into this social grid at a tariff which people can afford. In other words, selling the surplus energy that you don't use to people who really need it but can't normally afford it. And this kind of social grid system has never been done before and it's something which Scotland could pioneer. It also would mean that local communities would have their own source of generation. So if the major grid went down, there would be sources of supply for many thousands of people anyway. And this is a way of creating a robust system. It would also be future-proofed against things like massive solar flares, which can knock out power systems as well. All of these things would be useful to us. And there's no reason why Scotland can't do something as radical as this. I've mentioned also many times the idea of privatising, not privatising, sorry, wrong word, nationalising, we're already privatised, that's the problem, nationalising key utilities for public consumption. In other words, all energy which is intended for domestic use on the domestic circuit of that grid is priced lower. And it's priced lower because it's generated locally. The more locally it's generated, the lower the price it should be. And that will encourage people to more invest in their own generation systems. And the government could quite easily not only give grants to people to put solar panels on their roofs or to employ other forms of renewable energy, such as air or ground source heat pumps for their heating, but also even setting up small community uh, projects where, let's say, 15 houses, each one of them owns a 15th share of, say, a tidal energy turbine which is connected to the grid. Now that means each of those 15 houses gets all the energy they need from their own machine which they've invested in at minimal cost and any surplus energy generated by that can be sold into the social grid for a fixed price and all of those 15 households benefit. All of this can be done and having a distributed network like this with multiple energy sources, many hundreds or possibly thousands of them, would make it impossible for an aggressive state such as Russia to come along and basically knock out our power systems over a matter of weeks so that we don't freeze in the winter. This kind of idea of um, democratizing the power grid, democratizing the energy supply is not new and for many years we had uh, a nationalized coal board, we had a nationalized gas board, we had the nationalized electricity boards and those supplied energy to the population of the country at more or less fixed prices which only went up in line with inflation so there was no profit motive in there. That is what is wrong at the moment. This is why we're all suffering these massive energy prices. It's not because the cost of producing renewable energy is high. It's because those companies have been given the same tariffs as the gas uh, and coal and nuclear powered power station generators are getting. And because of this, we have a skewed system. Our renewable energy should be dirt cheap. It's virtually free apart from the cost of the machines themselves and the wires to get it to us. It therefore should not be costing anything like what it is at the moment. So I think we could learn a lesson from the travails which the Ukrainians are suffering at the moment, that their system is being gradually destroyed from outside via long-range missile strikes, which are extremely difficult to defend against. 
And this is something else we have to learn. When Scotland becomes independent, it's going to need a defensive system which can knock out long-range cruise missiles well before they get to us, because it is exactly that kind of long-distance warfare that Russia is now engaged in. And if Russia is capable of doing it to Ukraine and they are not stopped, then it could happen again anywhere else. Not saying it would happen to Scotland, but it's possible. And there has been an incident in or Orkney, Shetland, Shetland recently, where not one, but both of the major power cables connecting uh, Shetland to the mainland national grid were both cut at the same time. Now, that's extremely coincidental. It's very unusual for both to be severed at the same time. And the claim is that perhaps a fishing trawler has dragged something across the, the cables and broken them. That's entirely possible. But it's just as possible that a submarine came along and actually grappling hooked these cables and just dragged them a bit until they snapped. They're quite vulnerable unless they're buried below the seabed. So we need to think about hardening our energy systems for all sorts of reasons, not just against enemy attack. But when People attack another country, they will often go for the soft target, the low-hanging fruit. They will go for the civilians, just as the Russians are doing. They are trying to demoralize them, trying to freeze them out, trying to stop them getting food, stop them getting heat, because they can't beat them on the battlefield. And that is a sad fact of warfare. It happens all the time. So when we are designing our defensive systems and our energy systems, we need to learn the lessons of Ukraine. The Ukrainians have shown amazing resilience and inventiveness and creativity in fighting back against their invading Russian horde, and they have managed to beat them on the battlefield, which is incredible for such a small country facing such a huge opposition with so much ammunition. However, the destruction has been huge as well, and the cost in human lives has been massive on both sides. The only person who can stop the war, actually, is Vladimir Putin. Uh, but he's now committed himself so much that to stop the war now would be the end of his political career and possibly the end of his life. So he's not going to do it. Uh, obviously, the, the budget is in everybody's minds at the moment, and Jeremy Hunt has indicated that he's not going to actually raise the actual tax rates. But instead of doing that, he has stealthily sneaked in the tax rise by simply either maintaining or lowering the tax allowances. That's the amount of money you can earn before you start paying tax on the remaining part of your income, to the point where the only people who are really going to suffer are the ones who are working at the moment and perhaps not earning that much. It's always the low-paid workers who suffer in this. He has not really hurt the wealthiest of all in this budget. He's offering help in terms of uh, increased benefits, but only after next April. This is not a good budget. It's an austerity budget. The, um, the Bank of England is expecting a deep and lengthy recession. The Office for Budgetary Responsibility says it's only going to last a year and it'll all be over. So there's two competing theories here. But when the Bank of England, I think, starts to say that they're expecting a long and deep recession, I think I'd be paying attention to the Bank of England. The OBR, the Office for Budgetary Responsibility, is really a civil service branch. I'm not convinced that they're uh, prediction is the right one. I think I would go with the Bank of England here that Britain in general and in total, including all four parts of it, are in severe trouble. Britain has the only contracting um, economy of any Western nation. Coming out of COVID, everybody else's economy started to grow except Britain's. Britain's shrank. And mostly it's to do with Brexit. Brexit has been a spanner in the works all the time and nobody will say anything about it. Brexit is like the emperor's new clothes. Uh, people say that you know, there are benefits there to be had from Brexit, but in reality, they're invisible. They don't exist. And this is the problem that we face. And this is why Scotland really needs to be independent and why it needs to be making decisions about how it designs its own power systems and how that power is distributed to the various people who need it, but also how to make it more resilient, not only to attacks by countries that want to attack us, but also to natural environmental disasters and catastrophes as well, which could knock out power systems across the surface. 
having most of your um, electricity substations underground is a very good way of protecting them from things like solar flares. For example, electromagnetic pulse weapons, which are basically nuclear weapons exploded in the upper atmosphere, which generate enormous amounts of hard radiation, which just fry electrical equipment, something which is not ever been done, but let's not write it off, it could still happen. So anyway, I don't want to depress the hell out of you too much, but I think there are things that we need to think about here, and when we're designing the new Scottish state, let's design a power grid where people are paid for the energy they generate themselves, and let's encourage everybody to generate their own electricity at home. As many solar panels on roofs and buildings as possible, small rooftop turbines, anything goes. The government should really be, our Scottish government, telling people that when we're independent there is going to be a massive rollout of personalised home generation to make it possible for us not only to buy electricity that we need when we need it from the grid, but also to have a regular source of electricity throughout the day of our own making, which costs us virtually nothing other than the investment of putting the things on the roof in the first place. Anyway, that's it for me today. I have to get home. It's getting a bit dark and it's bucketing where I am at the moment. So I'll see you again, I hope, on Sunday. In the meantime, keep your chins up. Remember to keep the faith. Keep talking about these things. Discuss them online because these are important topics. When we're independent, we need to start thinking about this. It's not just about becoming independent. That's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. And the most important thing for us when we build this new state is to build it on new foundations with newly hardened systems that benefit the people and guarantee our energy supply at a fixed cost that everyone can afford. Anything we generate surplus to our needs can be sold to the international markets for a profit. There is still a place for profit-making companies in the energy market in Scotland, but not in the domestic sector. So that's it for me today. I'll see you all again on Sunday. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Bye for now.